Now, I have to, uh, just a couple of, of things to preface. By the way, I'm Michael Perez. Lovely to meet you. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know, some of you I've yet to know. Uh, some of you I have only known in a way that means that I don't know what I know, and that's okay too. Um, but I'm Michael Perez, and I've been doing NLP and hypnosis, as, as Nishi referred to earlier, uh, since the dawn of time. Um, you know, so uh, I'm learning this particular setup uh, for the first time. Uh, and we're going to be dealing with NLP modeling and specifically an introduction to modeling in, in the context of NLP. Uh, I'm going to start out by again saying I'm learning the software. I'm, I'm trying to do some tricky stuff with it. I don't know how well it's going to work. We're going to find out together. <laughs> so, so this is our opportunity to decide how quickly I was able to discern the structure of excellence when it comes to manipulating this particular piece of, um, of software. But uh, just to very quickly, and uh, as uh, now, let's see, is there, uh, can, if someone would be kind enough in the chat window to let me know what you're seeing at this point, are you seeing uh, a slide, or are you seeing my face, or some combination of the two? Anyone who'd who'd kindly give me some feedback, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, I'm hoping that right now you're seeing a slide, um, and it should it should say modeling in NLP 101. Uh, I, and I wanted to make that very clear that this is an introductory course, because I'm going to be talking to you for the next hour or so about modeling. Uh, I can't possibly teach a meaningful <laughs> modeling course in anything like that time, but I can give you a structure that may help you think about it, a map, if you will. Um, and I'm going to be touching on some history in a minute. And so in order to touch on that history, and again, unfortunately, no one has given me any feedback yet, or, or perhaps your silence feedback enough, but, uh, <laughs> But right now, um, I, I want to just point out uh, a very important thing. Hopefully, you'll be seeing this slide on your screen. Uh, it's a lovely picture of uh, Count uh, Alfred Korzybski. And, uh, and it says the map is not the territory. Um, so if you can see it, great. If you can't see it, I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm... I'm operating in the dark here a little bit. So my so Michael, we are able to everyone's able to see the slide as well as your video. So both we are good to beautiful, that. beautiful. Okay, that's what I wanted. Some feedback. Thank you, Nishith. You can mute yourself again, but I appreciate that that momentary <laughs> intervention to just give me some feedback. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the map is not the territory. And and what I mean specifically uh, by that in this context is I'm going to tell you a little bit of history, and I have to tell you that there are many different uh, tellings of this history. <laughs> so uh, some of them will be in sync with some of what I say. Some of them will not be in sync with some of what I say, and some of them may be, may be saying things that are entirely different. I can only tell you that I've heard the story many times from many sources, and I've put together a variation on the story that sounds like it makes the most sense to me, given what I know and given what I know of the interests of the people involved. <laughs> so, uh, cause this all started way back in the day before there was such a thing as NLP before there was even such a thing as meta, which is what NLP used to be before the term NLP ever existed. Um, but it was Richard Bandler watching a bunch of, Fritz Perl's films while he cataloged them uh, for the professor of psychology at whose house he was staying while that professor of psychology was visiting India, uh, funnily enough. And Richard was asked to watch these films specifically to get a, 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 an idea of what was on the films because essentially these weren't cataloged or anything. And it was a big stack of films. And so, the, you know, he had to put things down, like what was the reporting problem? What was the name of the client? Where did it take place? What was the, you know, so on and so forth. And, and to create kind of like a, a catalog for the film. So that way the professor would know what he had on what reel. And, um, 
And so as Bandler uh, was doing this, he was taking in a lot of information about which he had very little analytical understanding. He was just basically trying to understand what was going on. But after a while, after just watching film after film after film, uh, Richard got the notion that he felt like he could do what this guy was doing, Fritz Perls. Now, one of the other things that I should also say is that uh, in Gestalt therapy, there was a lot of books about it. There were a lot of discussion about it. It was quite a, a, a popular uh, sort of psychological niche that was rising up at the time. And there were a lot of people who were doing all the things that Fritz Perls said made, you know, Gestalt therapy work. They, they were using the Gestalt chair. They were imagining dead relatives. They were hitting each other with foam bats. They had all of this stuff going on. Uh, and they were doing the procedures that Fritz had said were, were, were what make the thing work. But what they were found was is that nobody was getting the same level of results, the same kind of magical results that Fritz Perls himself was getting. That was kind of the big thing was that Fritz Perls was able to get an order of magnitude of results better than most of the people who were practicing in the field. And Richard was watching him work and he was listening to him work. And of course, again, his attention was slightly elsewhere because he was busy doing the catalog. But after a while, he just sort of felt like he could do it. Now, this is the other thing about Richard is that Richard is a, uh, Richard's a bit of a practical joker. He's a funny guy. <laughs> and I really believe that, that, he, that this was essentially a practical joke that he wanted to pull because he just thought it was funny because Fritz Furls, uh, was an Austrian gentleman and he had very strong Austrian, uh, sort of affectations. You know, he had an Austrian accent and he dressed up like an Austrian fellow in his, his Austrian sweaters and that sort of thing. And so, um, what happened was, is that, uh, Richard decided that he was going to start uh, working at one of the local counseling centers. And he, and you know, like for example, Fritz Perls was a smoker. So Richard brought in a big pack, uh, you know, a big box of cigarettes and uh, Fritz Perls would wear these big Austrian sweaters. And Richard bought a couple of those and, uh, and, you know, Fritz Perls, he had a, a sick uh, Austrian accent. And so Richard started to speak in a Fritz Perls imitation with a Zeke Austrian accent. <laughs> and he just basically went in and he did Fritz Perls. He did a Fritz Perls impersonation. And what happened was he started to get results. He started to get really, really good results, better results than he did as, than if he tried to do it himself. So one of the things that, that happened then is that Richard being the analytical minded person that Richard is in many ways, um, he started to do subtractive analysis. He started to ask himself, I, okay, so I'm basically, this thing is working. What bits are necessary for this thing to work and what bits are not? So he started out with some simple things. Well, like, for example, if I don't wear these Austrian sweaters, does that make a difference? He doesn't wear the Austrian sweaters. It makes no difference. Okay. That's not a factor. Uh, is the chain smoking a factor? He stops chain smoking. That's not, that doesn't make a difference. Okay. It's not the cigarettes. I'm pretty sure that there was a certain amount of disappointment on the day that he discovered that the Austrian accent was not necessary <laughs> to help make a difference. But as he began to eliminate things and eliminate things and eliminate things, he eventually found that there were a set of questions a uh, set of, you know, areas of focus that Pearls would use that seemed to be eliciting the most difference, making the biggest impact on the clients. These were the differences that made a difference to use some NLP jargon for a moment. And so basically that's, that's, that became the core of the beginning of what we now know as the meta model. Now, of course, the problem was, is that now Richard had to sort of come up with like a descriptive structure for it. He had a really hard time doing that. He had um, uh, Frank Puselic, who's one of the guys that was, you know, that was also interested in Fritz Pearls at the time. I said, you know, hey, could you have, could you do what I did and then do this whole thing and try this subtractive analysis and see what you come up with? Well, he, you know, Puselic did the thing. 
And he came up with essentially the same kind of results and he pulled the same things out. And then he said to Pieselic, do you know how to describe this? Pieselic said, no, I can't. Now, Richard did have a way of describing it. He had come up, according to the story I heard from Richard, that he had come up with kind of like a logical flow chart, a sort of logic chart to explain um, what it was that he had elicited from this. But the problem was that no one else seemed to be able to make head or tails out of the chart that Richard created. <laughs> now, some of that might have been that he was a computer science student who had yet to take a computer science class because they had yet to build the computer. This is back in the, in the days when computers were buildings, <laughs> you know, and, and so there was no computer. They were building it still. And so he'd never, he'd never taken the classes yet. And so as a result, uh, you know, he was kind of operating by the seat of his pants. And that's when finally um, one of the people who was attending a Fritz Perls interest group that he and Frank were running at, at the university was an assistant uh, an associate professor of linguistics, John Grinder, and John, uh, they went to John, or John went to them, depending on whose version of the story. I think probably they went to him. They asked him to do the same thing that Frank had done. And then they said, do you have a way of describing this? And, and John, I suspect at that point said, I think I do. But again, this is my map. It's not necessarily what happened. It's what I think happened based on what emerged. And what emerged was, is that John was a professor of linguistics and his specialty was Noam Chomsky's transformational grammar. And so he used the structure of transformational grammar to describe what they had elicited by doing this kind of modeling. And the, the result was a meta model, um, a model that could be used to uncover information to understand how people thought about things. So it's a, it's a tool for modeling. And that was the first NLP model. Now, the reason that I've been so careful to point out that there are different versions of this story, there are also different versions of what modeling is. Depending on which tribe, which faction, which school of NLP you belong to, it may be that you think about it as one kind of thing, or it may be that you think about it as another kind of thing. There are some people who insist that, you know, modeling is essentially strategy elicitations. There are other people um, that, you know, do use, use one structure and other people that use another structure. There are some people that insist it has to be uh, uh, NLP modeling. Uh, John Grinder is one of those people. There's, there's an entire range of people who will tell you that modeling is one thing or another. And so I, I, I don't want to be parochial here. I'm going to try to give you my point of view, because one of the things that I've done, uh, I am a bit like a Bollywood movie in that uh, in, in almost every good Bollywood movie, if it runs long enough, there will be a scene set in Switzerland. Some sort of dance number that just for some reason is taking place in the Alps, and I don't know why. But uh, that's why I've decided that uh, it's, you know, I, I call Switzerland, I call it the uh, uh, Switzerlandistan, because that's the special area of India where Switzerland exists. And, uh, and so I try to be a bit like Switzerland in that I try to be kind of neutral. I don't really belong to any of the NLP factions. I try to take different things from different tribes in order to make them make sense and in order to make them function. Um, so I, I like cool stuff and I don't really care where they came, where they come from. <laughs> but I, but that does mean that I sometimes have to integrate conflicting reports, conflicting uh, points of view. But luckily, NLP is the study of subjective experience. <laughs> and it allows me to understand that all of this is subjective. It's the map, not the territory. And I can integrate a lot of people's maps and I can get a lot of function out of them without having to take them literally. And luckily for you, you can do the same too. <laughs> So I hope you'll permit me the, the leisure of being able to be a little bit uh, non-parochial and non-denominational <laughs> and avoid some of the infighting when I say that I believe all of them and I believe that they believe what they say. And simultaneously, um, the, the other great thing that Bandler and Grinder always used to say during their, their early seminars is one of them would come out and say, everything that we are 
going to tell you today is a lie. And the other one would say, everything that we're telling you today is the truth. Because it's subjective. It's, it's true to an extent. It's useful. It's more important. So any model in the context of NLP must be useful in some way. It must have a purpose. It must have a use. It must be, it must serve an outcome. Does that make some sense? There's no point in modeling something. It's no point in extracting the way something works, the structure of how something works, unless, unless and until you want to be able to make a use out of it. Now, the great thing about this bias towards uh, this kind of utilitarian bias, let's call it that, it's got to be useful for something. It's got to do something is that then you can test it, right? If you have a model that's supposed to make you a better salesperson, your numbers should go up. If you have a model that makes you a better tennis player, then your scores, your win loss record should go up. If you have a model that's going to make you, you know, a better conversationalist, then the, the number of people who like talking to you should go up. <laughs> The satisfaction of having conversations with you amongst the people who do that subjectively should go up, right? Make some sense? So what we're saying is, is that we're looking for the structure of how someone does something. And NLPers usually, although not always, model exemplars. That's a person who's an example. An exemplar of excellence. This is somebody who does something in some amazing way. And NLPers suddenly become really interested because they go, how do you do that? <laughs> because they want to know. And so therefore we, we come up with uh, these, these wonderful models of what people know. Now, there are two kinds of modeling and both of them exist in the context of NLP. Now, again, there are other kinds of modeling. There's computer models. There's uh, mathematical models. There's, you know, there's, there's all kinds of models. These are not what we're talking about in the context of NLP. Okay. What we're talking about in the context of NLP is what is a structure for how someone does, th does something so that I can consistently change what I do if I follow their model instead of my old model so that I can get the the order of experience, you know, of outcomes that they were getting. Um, I'm going to take another moment and we're going to come back to, to this in a moment, but I want to uh, point something out here first. One thing that almost always happens if you ever attend uh, one of the longer prac courses that actually, or, or master prac courses that actually has a modeling component, very often people will pick uh, a complicated physical skill like juggling. Juggling's a real popular one. They'll go and model a juggler. And then when the time comes for them to juggle, they will drop the balls. <laughs> well, one thing that's important to understand is that um, when, you're, uh, when you're trying to get better at being a juggler, what that means is, is that if you take the distinctions of excellence from a great juggler, if you know how to juggle and you add those to what you know, you will then juggle, juggle better than you did before, more like your exemplar. If you didn't know how to juggle, only extracting some hints about how to juggle really well once you know how to juggle is of limited use. Does that make some sense? Okay, we're going to come back to that in a minute. But there are two kinds of modeling that happen in the context of NLP. One is what I'm going to call analytical modeling. And the other is what I'm going to refer to as implicit modeling. Now to give you a really good idea of how, the difference between these two, the analyst comes in with an outcome. He starts watching, listening, feeling, everything that's going on with that outcome in mind, he then, or she then, makes some judgments, makes some logical uh, uh, thinking about it, and then starts to build, you know, uh, uh, a map 
of the structure based on their observations. This may also include talking to the exemplar. Just a moment here while I very quickly going to adjust my, my own particular rear end because uh, it was starting to ache a little bit. My apologies for the... <laughs> for the things you probably didn't need to know about my own experience. But, um, but yeah, so the thing is, is that, the, so they're, they're maybe talking to the exemplar and they're saying, well, what do you do? What's the next thing you do? What's the next thing you do? And then what do you do after that? So that they're getting an analysis of what the process is. And they can, they can observe, they can ask, they can combine these things, they can integrate them and they can come up with, um, with a, a structure, you know, and then they can take that structure and then turn around and do it. And then if that works, you know, if it, if it, if it improves performance, now, now they've elicited a model. Now there, the, you know, you can come up with some, some amazing analytical uh, approaches. Now, you know, for example, I think uh, uh, Jonathan Alfold in the U S uh, does a thing called genius mapping if, if i'm remembering the name correctly that's an amazing analytical approach it's super good and it's really good at recovering um some stuff that you know that experts do and understanding you know what their flow is and what their procedures are the, the second kind of modeling is implicit modeling now this one is a little bit harder to teach because it's a little bit kind of kind of weird and it's less structured. It's hard to describe certain things. I think you'll understand if it's not clear what the progression is, it's not clear what the steps are. Um, for example, just show of hands to yourselves. How many of you are walkers? How many of you at one point in your life walked or have learned to walk? Any of you walkers here in the room? Okay. How many of you are talkers? Hands up. Raise your hand to yourself if you have ever learned how to talk or ever learned to understand anyone else talking. Okay. Here's the great thing about walking and talking. No one presented you with a framework so that you could logically work out how to walk and talk. <laughs> you were cast adrift in a world that you did not yet understand with a body you did not yet understand. And there were a bunch of exemplars of excellence walking around and talking around. And you picked it up. You absorbed it like a sponge, even though you didn't understand what they were saying. And you didn't really understand how it was that they were doing that thing with their body that you couldn't do at all. I mean, when you started out as babies, you were just, you know, you had no control of your body whatsoever. You, you know, the first thing you could do is sort of move your head around and then focus your eyes, you know, but everything else was just, you know, arms and legs wailing around, <laughs> right? And then, well, I'm, I'm, I could ask you if you remember it, but I, I don't think many of you do. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe you have better memories than I do. Um, and if so, you know, uh, uh, you know, God bless you. But I, I got, I've got to tell you that for me, I had no idea. I can't remember the time before walking. I can't remember the time before talking, but I've seen walkers and I've seen talkers. And when that happened, um, every time uh, they pick it up without anyone going, okay, well, the first thing you have to do is you've got to put your weight on the back foot. And then you, well, in fact, many times they can't talk before they walk, or at least they can't talk well enough to understand a description of walking. They're not taken into a classroom and given walking classes. <laughs> you know, that none of that ever happens because they could, they, they wouldn't understand what was being said anyway. At that point, you know, they're really good to be saying mama and dada and, and a few other choice words that they picked up from the parents, you know, but that's about it. <laughs> they're mostly talking gibberish. And again, before you're talking, you're not talking. Before you're understanding, you're not understanding. And yet we pick it up. And this means that we unconsciously and implicitly, without analysis, start to understand these things. It's the way you learned how to do the things that you do the most, uh, with the greatest level of unconscious expertise, are the things that you've picked up implicitly. Now, going back to that Bandler story, we could say that Bandler and then Puselic and then Grinder 
picked up implicitly what Fritz Perls was doing. And they whittled it down analytically, you know, but, but first the, the uptake portion was implicit. And, and this is where we're going to kind of get to, to the structure of that kind of modeling process. The first thing you're doing, you know, again, when you're kids, you're watching people walk, you're watching people talk, you're listening to people talk even better, right? <laughs> but you're watching them too. And then that kind of sensory input turns out that once you absorb enough of that, and once you reach a certain point, then some of that starts to make enough sense for you to start acting on. And so the intake starts to become performance. And that performance then basically starts to improve until eventually going on what you have seen, going on what you have taken in and going on your own experience, then basically these things become your own excellence. Now at that point or at a later point, you know, cause the, uh, to do this next bit, you have to have a fully functioning language and you have to have a brain that's a lot more functional than maybe a five-year-olds might be, but you can go into analysis mode. Can you not? You can think about how it is that you do it. If you've ever taken a class in Hindi or in English or whatever it might be, and I'm not talking about a class in the language, but a class on the language, you can hear what linguists have done as they have used analytical thinking to map out language and to explain the logic of it. But you can be perfectly fluent in your language. You can even be downright poetic in your language. You can be a compelling storyteller in your language and not understand the logic of it. But if you don't understand the logic of it, it's really hard to describe it. And a description is a necessary component in teaching it. Unless you're teaching it imp with implicit uptake. Does that make sense? It's the difference between that kind of that kind of, of performance where, where someone is explaining to you how something works versus somebody demonstrating to you how something works. But even then, it's the difference between you sort of taking in what's happening versus you trying to understand and trying to force an analysis on what's happening. So the analytical mode is really about that. Now I'm going to talk to you about one of the drawbacks um, to the analytical mode. And it's one of the reasons why there's, you know, John, John Grinder's not a big fan of it. John Grinder's a big fan of his version of NLP modeling. The, the thing he calls NLP modeling is very much an implicit uh, model, but he has a very specific way of thinking about it. Um, I'm going to go into that in a moment and I'll talk to you about why, but let's talk about the brain for a moment. Um, you have, and, and we can see here, uh, on this lovely, uh, transparent fellow who's decided to volunteer as our model here, <laughs> uh, you can see that the orange part of his brain, and I have to tell you that in reality, it's not orange, nor is it glowing, but I can also tell you that this gentleman isn't normally transparent either, unless something very weird has happened to him. Uh, but the little bit marked out in orange here is the bit we call the prefrontal cortex. Now there is an aspect to the free prefrontal cortex because it looks like it's about what, like that looks like maybe like a quarter to a third of the brain. Right. But you also have to understand this. The prefrontal cortex is only a few centimeters thick. It's about an inch thick for those of you who use Imperial <laughs> measurements. Um, so it's the, it's like a layer up front. Okay. All the parts where I'm bald, where I don't have hair anymore. <laughs> that pretty much is where my prefrontal cortex is. Okay. I'm, I, my, my defense of that is that uh, all the hair fell out because of all the activity going on up here, <laughs> but it only goes about this, this deep. And then the rest of it is just the rest of my brain. But, but you only have a little bit of your brain that's organized around the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is also organized into an area we call the neocortex. And the reason we call it neo is just, you know, neo means new, it means it's relatively new real estate, right? <laughs> it's something that has only popped up, uh, in, you know, in our ancestors a few million years back. 
Most animals don't have this bit, or if they do have it, it's very, very small. Ours is the most sophisticated. Now, what's important about the prefrontal cortex is that this is where conscious awareness is. How many of you are conscious right now? <laughs> After I've been talking this long, um, there are a few of you who may not be answering that question, but that's okay. Because <laughs> what I want you to think about is that essentially any kind of conscious awareness you have of what you see, what you hear, what you feel, any of your sensory experience, and also some of what you think, a little bit of what you think, your internal dialogue, that, that kind of thing, or stuff that you picture or feel or smell, you know, that kind of stuff. That is all taking place in this one little bit of, me of memory, or this one little bit of the brain. And here's what's interesting about that. This little bit of the brain doesn't understand most of what's going on in your brain. Because <laughs> conscious awareness and because and your, your prefrontal cortex, not even all of that is inside of your conscious awareness. There's lots of stuff going on that you don't, you don't know that you're thinking, that you don't know that you're feeling, that you don't know that you're remembering. Um, that you don't know that you're doing, that you don't know that you're performing. There's all kinds of stuff. Now I'm going to take a moment. Conscious awareness is very, very poor at understanding what's happening in your brain. It's very poor at understanding what you do. And it's very poor at, um, at tracking or even remembering what you do. Um, memory is highly unreliable. Memory is seldom accurate. There's all kinds of stuff that is a problem. Now, if I'm trying to understand how an exemplar of excellence does something amazingly well, and I'm trying to get their report about what it is that they're doing, well, it turns out that most of what's going on in their brain, most of their conscious awareness of what they are doing. Um, they're, uh, what's happening unconsciously is most of it. And what's happening unconsciously is in fact, uh, not inside of their awareness very often. Now, in fact, most of you will remember that one of the reasons for the meta model was to attempt to recover stuff that had slipped outside of conscious awareness, right? And, and of course, most of us also kind of know that the Milton model is about slipping things into unconscious awareness, <laughs> getting it outside of conscious awareness. So this is all really important to get if you want to understand why implicit modeling and why people like John Grinder harp on implicit modeling. It's because... If I am trying to analyze something consciously, or if I am asking an exemplar to analyze something consciously, they do not have conscious access to most of what they're doing. In that very same uh, film series, which I won't show you this next bit because apparently the audio is not being transmitted. And that, my apologies. Again, new software that I'm not really familiar with. But what happens is that basically they, they, they take um, a group of athletes at a college and in this uh, uh, amongst these athletes, they, they tell them, they say, look, here's what we would love for you to do. Um, we would like for you to catch this drone and they have a drone inside the auditorium that's moving around in a certain pattern. And, uh, and they have to eventually sort of figure out the pattern and figure out how to grab the drone. Now, what's interesting is, is that the drone's running like a preset pattern. And there's also some place, you know, they're not trying to grab it with the blades. That'd be very painful, <laughs> both for them and the drone. But they, they eventually manage to catch the thing. Uh, and the ones who successfully catch it, what they do is, is that they ask them. Uh, just moments after they've you know, chase the thing around and then finally figured out how to catch it. And they ask them a question. They say, well, can you tell us about what you did to catch it? And they, they, you know, what you do first, what you do next, you know, almost like a bit, not, not too terribly far from a strategy elicitation in NLP. 
And what's interesting is, is that of like, let's say the 10 uh, exemplars who caught the drone, they described 10 different things. Like I found that I needed to take the drone and, and I had to imagine where it was going next. And then I had to try to anticipate it and I had to, you know, do this and do that. And they were all describing all these strategies, right? But the other thing that they did was even while they were asking them about, you know, please describe how it was that you caught the drone. They were taking high speed photography of them trying to catch the drone and then eventually catching the drone. And what they found was is that even though these 10 exemplars had 10 different descriptions of what it was that they did to catch the drone, all of them, once they successfully were able to capture the drone, essentially followed exactly the same methodology. Because there was only, it was, the, the thing was rigged so that there's only really one way to catch the drone. First, you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and that's what they did. The problem was no one could describe what they did. And that's because what they were doing was happening outside of their conscious awareness. Is this starting to make sense? If I'm trying to get somebody, if I'm trying to take an analysis of how someone is doing what it is that they are doing and, and they've, and they're doing something very analytically, then, you know, yeah, there's a good chance I might be able to ask them to tell me how they do it. And they can maybe give me a step-by-step. -step. If they don't have a step-by-step, -step, I might be able to help them to develop one. But, if, if I'm talking about anything that has uh, any kind of major reliance on, on processing, mental processing that takes place out of consciousness, and so much of what we think, what we feel, and what we do takes place outside of conscious awareness, that means that what they're actually doing is they are taking the little bits of it that they know, and they are guessing and creating a plausible explanation because they don't know. Consciousness doesn't have that awareness. Consciousness doesn't control your body. That takes place in a part of the brain that's not in your prefrontal cortex. Consciousness does not control your emotional life. That takes place, now it's aware of some of your emotional life, but it doesn't control it, doesn't initiate it, doesn't do it. Consciousness in a way, one way of thinking about consciousness is that consciousness likes to take credit for the stuff that it's aware of but it doesn't do the stuff that it's aware of, even though it kind of feels like it is. So if you want some insight into how someone does something, or if you even want some insight into how you do something, then it is unconscious, pre-conscious understanding that becomes most important. And so uh, one thing that, that both co-founders of NLP have said at one time or another. And again, I understand that some people disagree with this. Again, the map is not the territory. Different people have different maps. But it's something that they've said, and it's something that I fundamentally agree with. They've, they've, they've both said in their own ways that um, inducing altered states of consciousness, or another way of putting that is hypnosis, is a fundamental part of NLP. Bandler has gone so far as to say that NLP is hypnosis. And if we think about, again, if we think about hypnosis, one definition of it is being, putting you into a state of consciousness where you have expanded awareness or different awareness, then that's one way of thinking about it, is it not? Because, again, what, what's one of the foundational things that you learned in NLP? Hopefully, if you took a good NLP course, one of the first things that they, that they, they taught you was how to calibrate, right? How to observe people their tone, their tempo, their breathing, the location of it, all that kind of stuff. How fast are they breathing? How slow are they breathing? How deeply are they breathing? How shallowly are they breathing? What's their, what's their posture? What's their muscle tone, tension? What's the expression on their face, right? And, and although you can try to do that consciously, I think that some of you who have practiced this understand that when you're, try, when you're concentrating it on too much, you're actually kind of terrible at it. But then if you just let it go and let it happen unconsciously, you tend to get better at it. 
Well, I have to tell you something. See, here's a secret about you, and you may or may not know this. And for those of you who are hearing this for the first time, um, I'm both excited for you and I'm going to apologize to you in advance for what I'm going to tell you, because that's going to completely change the way you think about yourself and everybody else you ever meet. You are a human being. <laughs> and as a homo sapien, as a member of this fine species in which we all coexist, you have ways of understanding other homo sapiens that you are not consciously aware of. You pick up signs, you pick up vibes, you pick up all kinds of, you know, energy is the way that some people describe it. Now, I'm not talking about anything spooky. I'm not talking about crystals and chakras at the moment. Well, I can talk about that, but we're not going to right now. I'm saying that, that neurologically and biologically, you've got sensory information that you have access to in some parts of your brain that you don't have conscious access to. And you understand other people better than you consciously understand that you understand them. And when Bandler and Pieselic and Grinder were watching all these Fritz Perls films, they were taking them in, but another part of them was kind of doing something with them, was learning from them without that kind of analysis, because they didn't have, they weren't doing the kind of front brain analysis. They were just sucking it in. They were like sponges. Some people call it a sponge state. Other people call it a know nothing state, but they were just, they didn't know. They didn't know what was happening. They were just taking it in. And then after a while it started to come up and then they felt like they wanted to perform it and they did. And then that performance, they calibrated the performance and they found out that that performance was in line with the exemplar. The order of, of results that the exemplar was getting. And then once they had that, then they could, because the thing is, look, I can't go into Fritz Perls's brain, especially since Fritz Perls is no longer amongst the living. I can't go into Fritz Perls's brain and go sifting through and try to figure out what it feels like to him to think like him, to have that unconscious access to his brain. But if I'm performing it because I sucked it all in, it's easier for me to analyze it in my head as I'm doing it than it is for me to analyze it in your head than when you're doing it. And so then the it can be, taken apart. It can be at that point, once your performance is in line with the exemplar, then you can help to provide an insight into your own performance, which, it, which can help us to discover the structure of it. Is this making sense? So, you know, the first thing you're doing is, is that you're learning how to do the thing. That's the uptake portion. That's where you're taking the stuff in. The next part is where you have to analyze it in order to describe it so that it can be taught. Because right now, all I know is I, I know a way to learn really well. But what I don't know yet is I don't know how to teach it. So the so to go back to my slides here for a moment, analytical modeling, or just strict analytical modeling, relies almost solely on conscious analysis and conscious description. And therefore, it's not engaging with most of your brain, which is where most you know the most about yourself and where, you know, your exemplar knows the, about, the most about themselves, but can't describe it because they can't talk with that part of their brain. <laughs> okay. Speech center isn't there. But implicit modeling, on the other hand, allows an unconscious uptake. It allows you to suspend analysis, take it in like you did when you, when you took in speaking and, and, and walking when you were a child. And then without that kind of judgment, without that kind of analysis, start to embody the thing, embody the performance of the exemplar. And then not cutting out 
you know, the ne the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, because that prefrontal cortex is so useful. We can use it to help describe it so that we can teach it. We can start to take out those kinds of distinctions. Does that make some sense so far? So if you think about it that way, then basically implicit modeling is whole brain modeling. Whereas analytical modeling is limited to the prefrontal cortex. And therefore, it's highly, now, in the first off, analytical modeling can be faster sometimes. Analytical modeling can still be quite insightful. You can still bring some stuff into awareness by, by taking someone through an analytical approach. And analytical modeling can be highly useful. And sometimes you don't need to do um, implicit modeling. But implicit modeling can potentially bring in a, uh, you know, some insights, which you wouldn't get only by doing analytical modeling. But here's the trick. Analytical modeling, once you perceive that something happens a certain way, oh, we start to get a thing called confirmation bias. If we think something happens a certain way, it literally starts to change what we see, what we hear, and our felt sense of these things in order to confirm that what we think we is true is, is true, whether it's true or not. So this is why actually doing analytical modeling is great, but don't take that stuff into consideration when you're doing implicit modeling because it will prejudice you and you might miss some stuff. This is why a lot of times we talk about modeling arrays. An array means you actually do several different kinds of modeling, several different passes. And, and in a modeling array, implicit modeling should always come first. And then the analysis of the implicit modeling, because first you're taking stuff in without judgment, without analysis. Then you're analyzing it, and then you're describing it. After that, you can come back and then do a pass of one of the analytical modeling methodologies, you know, like strategy elicitations or whatever. And those things can then add uh, additional distinctions, additional details can be, can be learned by doing those things in that way. I hope this is making sense because I think that if you really get this, you'll understand why there are partisans for different kinds of modeling in the NLP uh, field why there's disagreement about what kind of modeling is the right or correct kind of modeling. Again, I'm nonpartisan. I just think you do the right kinds of modeling in the right situations and in the right order. And that just means understanding that they all have a value. They all have a function. They all have a use. It's only a question of how. Now, once you've analyzed it, the final thing you need is you need a structure or a framework that you can then use to describe the model. So if we go back to the Bandler and Grinder example, Bandler had, uh, you know, he had, had settled it down to a few distinctions, but he didn't have a nice framework to bring it all together in a cohesive and a coherent way. What Grinder was able to bring in was transformational grammar, which gave a framework for making the whole thing make a kind of holistic sense. Does that make sense? And so the description phase usually requires a structure or framework uh, so that you can say it's like this. Those of you who are fond of metaphors will, will understand. Human beings tend to think uh, from simple structures to complex structures, from concrete structures to abstract structures. And it helps us to understand what something is like if we can get that kind of a structure from it. Now, if you understand that, now, you know, at the beginning, I wanted to be very clear that this was my map, that this was my um way of thinking about it so that I'm not, I don't want to step on anybody else's toes. And I don't want to say that, that any methodology is 
inferior or superior, that they all just have their their strengths and their weaknesses. And in fact, it, the more that you know, the, the more methodologies you have, the better off you probably are, the more distinctions you're going to be able to get. This is also true for structures or frameworks. The more structures or frameworks, and again, you know, you could say that one thing that you'd have to learn in order to do to, to build the meta model, if you wanted to be a modeler on that scale, then one of the things that would be necessary would be to, you know, have a doctorate in linguistics. <laughs> now, clearly, I'm not saying that. Uh, but the meta model required uh, an intricate knowledge of transformational grammar. If it were being constructed today, maybe it'd be based on a different linguistic theory. Maybe the model would look different, but it would essentially use some other complex methodology to describe it. It doesn't require anything like that. You can come up with another way of describing it. Again, metaphors work really, really well in this context. What's this like? Also understanding that, again, don't necessarily focus on everything being a sequence because things don't happen in the brain in a sequence. Very often you're doing multiple things simultaneously. Very often experience and, and performance are a matrix of things that are going on all at the same time. So don't worry about things having to go step by step because life doesn't happen step by step most of the time. Okay, step by step is just there as like training wheels. You can let go of that stuff too. So this is what's important is that when you're in NLP courses, you're going to learn most of the stuff about, you know, in a good course or a good modeling um, workshop or, or whatever it is that you're doing, you'll pick up so much of this stuff up to and an, 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 an right at the description. And the description is where, you know, again, that's something that you work on in a longer term thing. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. And that's that's a thing worth doing, in my opinion. So it requires a little bit more thought. And this is where we come back to this idea. And I want to go back to Krasivsky. The map is not the territory. The only usefulness of a map depends on the similarity of structure between the empirical world and the map. And he goes on to explain that a little bit more. And he says, two important characteristics of maps should be noted. A map is not the territory it, re it represents, but if correct, it has a similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness. Because I want you to think about that one for a moment. The only value of a map, if you had a map with everything on it, it would be useless. Because if everything were on it, every single little detail it would have so much stuff that it would be incomprehensible. It would be the same as the world. The value of a map is that a map has a structure that's similar to the world, but is not the world. But it's simpler so that you can take it on board. Okay, so we're create we're using models to create maps. The, descri the descriptions that are created by models, these Differences that make a difference, these structures, these, um, these, these procedures, these mindsets, these attitudes, these states, whatever they may happen to be, whatever comes out of it, is meant to be simplified. Again, that, that process of elimination that brought it down to distinctions. And then create a structure for those distinctions so that they come together in a way that's like a map. And the purpose of a map is not to be true. The purpose is an, a, of a map is to be useful. I want to say that again. The purpose of a map is not to be true. The purpose of a map is to be useful. If a map doesn't actually contain everything being mapped, that's fine as long as it lets you get from point A to point B, if that's the purpose of the map. It doesn't matter what's left out. It doesn't matter if something is a little bit wrong or a little bit curved or a little bit off, as long as the map is highly functional. It doesn't matter how deleted, distorted, or generalized that map may be, as long as it works to get you where the map is taking you. Does that make some sense? 
Now, I'm going to give you one last thing this evening. And this is a little something for you to take away. Because one of the things that we talked about a moment ago was the idea that in order to create this kind of analysis, you really need to get into a state which allows you to experience, to suck things in like a sponge, like you, but like you don't know anything. It's precluding judgment. It's precluding analysis. It's precluding jumping to a conclusion that cuts off your interest or jumping to a conclusion that then causes everything you do to conform via confirmation bias to the, to the conclusion that you reached. You start discarding stuff that doesn't agree or minimizing stuff that doesn't agree or even reframing stuff that doesn't agree so that it matches your mental model. We want to hold off on drawing that map until we suck in the territory as best we can. So one thing that I do, and I'm just going to give you, and this is something you can practice in your own time. You can practice with me a little bit now if you'd like. I have a place that I go in my physiology, in my uh, way that I think about things. I have a place that I go, which is me when I'm curious and me when I'm fascinated to the point that I forget to analyze. And for me, it really is about, now again, this may vary for you. You you need to find what your own thing is, but this may give you a clue. I'm going to give you my map, and my map might not work exactly for you, but it might give you a clue to how to build your map to your place. Okay? Because I have to ask about who am I when I have so much curiosity and wonder. I wonder when I have so much curiosity and so much wonder that I forget to analyze. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can ask yourself, when when was the time? You can imagine what it was like to be a child listening to language and not understanding it, watching walking when you couldn't reproduce it, but feeling it in your body starting to emerge. But one thing that I do is You ever notice that there are certain kinds of gestures that you might get when you're curious? I wonder. I wonder what I'm like when I'm curious. In fact, have you ever noticed that maybe even when you're really curious about something, your voice might change? Maybe your inflections go a certain way? Maybe even you're kind of drawing your words out a little bit more. Maybe there's a little bit more uh, like, like, mm, huh, huh, hmm. Is that the sound you make when you're curious? Hmm, hmm. I don't know. I wonder. Hmm. Some of you may have noticed that my shoulders changed. Some of you have noticed that my posture changed. Some of you may have noticed my eyebrows are doing a little jig up there. (laughs) Can you hear the changes in my tone, my tempo? Maybe even the changes where I'm putting my eyes? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, what's my hand suddenly doing here, right? (laughs) One thing I love about India is that you can always tell when people are weighing information. (laughs) But even then, that's that's a part of wondering, is it not? Is that part of how you wonder? I wonder. I do wonder. And the more that you practice this place, I'm going to give you another little quick hint. You can take the tip of your tongue. If you have a tongue, you probably have a tip to it. And you know that little ridge right up here, just behind your front teeth? You can touch the tip of your tongue to that little ridge right right behind your teeth. 
And what's interesting is, is that it can even cause some of your internal dialogue to suddenly either slow down or stop. Because you can't verbalize. And some of us, when we talk in our heads, we sub-vocalize. We just move our mouths a little bit to match this voice in our heads. Sometimes just doing this, it can slow down the internal dialogue or stop it entirely. So what happens? And I've got my tongue there as I'm, hmm, hmm. And then one thing I might even do is that sometimes when I'm really in a sense of wonder after, because the curiosity kind of gives way to wonder for me sometimes. And then I just, I'm kind of like, wow. 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 Do you have that place that you go where you, maybe your physiology opens up a little bit? Maybe your eyes widen? I'll give you another little hint. Sometimes I go into peripheral vision to allow my attention to be drawn by movement. Wow. Just letting my eyes be guided, not by where I choose to put them by, but by whatever is happening. I just stay in peripheral vision until something draws my attention and therefore my focus. And when my focus is there, then I allow it to drift again until it happens again, and so on and so forth, and ad infinitum. I hope that this will give you some clues in how you might find your own empty state, your own no judgment, no analysis state, your own no nothing state. As uh, Robert Diltz occasionally refers to it as, is a nurk nurk state, like you're some alien who just walked off your flying saucer and you have no idea what you're looking at, but it's all interesting. <laughs> and letting go of what you know and letting go of analysis and just sucking it all in, taking it all in, soaking it all up. And then when that fullness starts to arise, then you can start to act out on it. Again, without judgment, just see what, see what arises. Allow yourself to act out on those things that are arising within you now. Hmm. I wonder. I wonder what it is that you'll begin to experience as you begin to notice the changes. And tonight, as you sleep and dream, you may find that all of these things can become more and more obvious, more and more of the time, as your unconscious mind allows you to begin to assort and assemble all of these things in a way that causes them to be a part of your behavior more and more, moving forward into the hours, the days, the weeks, the months, and the years ahead as you become more and more the person who absorbs without judgment, performs without limitation, and then understands from a new and never-before-existing point of view as that excellence begins to arise within you as you are today. And with that, my friends, there is something that I also want to leave this on. If you're thinking about the usefulness of these maps, because look, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you just one quick last story. The one thing that happened to me some years ago was when I realized that uh, I was watching Erickson do some work. And as I was looking at these old films and I was reading some of these old case studies, I realized that there were things that he was doing and could do and, and was demonstrating that were not in the Milton model. 
<laughs> and one of the things that 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 struck me was is that you know if if a model is a good whole form model um then you know then that's something that you know that definitely needs to be included and so you know i did some work of my own uh, modeling ericsson based on these things uh this is a program that i call the Duron code which is all about hypnotic communication if this is something that you're interested in if you'd like to learn more about altered states of consciousness and that kind of thing please uh, don't hesitate to contact Nishith and uh, I'll be in India in November teaching my neuron code material. If you'd like to work more with me, if you'd like to uh, spend some time with me, I'd be glad to see you. Now, Nishith is letting me know that uh, it is time for you to ask questions. Because if you've got questions, I've got answers. Some of them may even have something to do with the correct answer to those questions. I don't know. We're going to find out because I wonder what it is that you might ask. So please feel free. Uh, Nishith, uh, do you have do you have sent some questions that have been sent as things have gone along or anybody sending them now? And now I wonder how long it will take. So before Nishith can unmute himself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. So we've just opened up the questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box and, uh, I, uh, and we can answer that. And yeah, I'm perfectly happy to answer any questions that may come up. And also any comments, if you just, if if there was something that you thought was interesting or or uh, something that you felt like adding, uh, you know, feel feel free to send send it towards Nishith and let him know, and he can relay that to everyone else. Okay, so we've got our first question that's from Amy, and she's asking, what is the correlation between conscious and conscious and modeling? Well. Basically, um, consciousness, or uh, let's uh, let, I'm going to put a slightly different word on consciousness in order to help us to make the distinction. Uh, let's call consciousness awareness. So there's stuff that's happening in your brain that you are aware of, and there's stuff that's happening in your brain that you're not aware of. There's stuff happening in the world that you have conscious awareness of, and there's stuff happening in the world that you don't have conscious awareness of. So in modeling, the, because when we're modeling human beings, because so much of what we do happens outside of consciousness, it is useful to have unconscious uptake of some of that material. Does that make sense? Because you, if I tried to get you to describe it, you couldn't necessarily describe it to me properly because you don't have access to that part of your brain and I don't have access to that part of my brain either. But when we do this unconscious thing, it's it, we're able to pick up stuff that we wouldn't pick up just sheerly through analysis. And so that's, that's the, that's the, the basic relationship between the two. That's one of the reasons why, again, in a lot of uh, NLP style modeling, uh, the precursor to NLP style modeling is often, uh, as Grinder said, you know, all NLP essentially starts with a, a state zero, um, which is an altered state of consciousness. So um, that is kind of the trick to modeling is that if you understand that that you can pick up stuff that you don't know that you're picking up and that you'll only be able to see when you're actually doing it then that will help you to you know see or, or hear or feel uh when you're doing it that'll help you to 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 pick up pick things up from the exemplar that you wouldn't get in just simple conscious observation or or simple um uh, you know modeling or the description or the exemplar's description, you know, again, which, because again, the, the Fritz Perl stuff from Gestalt uh, uh, therapy didn't produce the same level of results as the, those specific um, questions, which he used, but didn't describe uh, in, in, you know, in his descriptions of his work. You should anything else. Oh, and thank you by the, for that question, by the way. Just take a second to mute and unmute. Uh, no I'm just waiting if there are any more questions. Just 
Just a moment. Okay. Okay, so the next question is from Bhavana. Mm -hmm. And she would like to know, so when we do implicit modeling, sometimes yes. we pick up an unpleasant aspect too. Like for example, chain smoking, uh, like uh, Bandler picking it up. So how to be aware of this? Okay, can, can you please repeat that? Because you uh, blipped out about halfway through that, that, that question there. So when we do implicit modeling, sometimes we pick up unpleasant aspects of it. Like sometimes when we're modeling yes. someone and we pick up chain smoking that they do. So yeah. how to be aware of this? Okay. So filters in modeling, um, just to sort of simplify it for my own uh, consumption. One thing to think about is this, and this is a basic neurological thing. Like, for example, let's say that I was uh, uh, helping, uh, that I was doing some modeling of somebody who was chain smoking. Well, one thing that I would be doing is that I would be stepping into their world for a second to pace and lead them, right? Um, so I'd be modeling the client in order for me to understand what they're going through. Well, they, if somebody's a chain smoker, they have been smoking for years and years and years, and they have neurological structures which are designed around this addictive pattern. Now, if I step into it for 10 minutes, I'm not going to pick up a smoking habit. First off, I don't have any cigarettes around. Secondly, I'm not a smoker. Thirdly, I don't have these neurological structures. So it's kind of okay for me to step into it because I don't have the limitations that this person has. In fact, very often we can describe what they have as a stuck state. They're in a, they're, they're caught in a series of states where they, they, they don't know a way out of wherever it is that they are, whether it's an addiction, whether it's grief, whether it's depression, whether it's whatever it may happen to be. But the thing about me is, is that I'm not depressed. I'm not sick. I'm not grieving. I'm not addicted. I don't have those problems and therefore I can step into them and I can also step out of them. And then I can ask myself, how did I step out of them? That should give me an idea of what kind of resources I needed to step out of them. And that should also give me an idea of what kind of resources I might want to help the client to use as they step out of it. And then that gives me a starting place for an intervention. Now at that point, then it's about the tote model, right? You test, you operate test again, you see how, see where that's getting you. And then you, you make adjustments and then you, eventually you get to the point where, um, where that person is able to get out of that state and get in and, and add resources to create a new state where again, they're a person who doesn't smoke. They're a person who is at choice about smoking. They're a person who doesn't, who couldn't have that problem. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite questions comes from old Joe Riggio who, and I, I know he's not that old, but uh, he, he always says, you know, who are you when you can't possibly have the problem? So, you know, that's a way of getting there using modeling in that context. I hope, uh, you know, cause that, that's a really deep question. It's one that deserves a lot more time. Um, if you're ever on a course with me, uh, I can devote a couple of hours to it, but I hope that that at least gives you a reason why most of the time, setting up filters is not that big of a deal, but, uh, but again, make, just make sure that you're, that you are in a good state yourself. Make sure you've got your resources easy, you know, easily available. Um, if you're doing a lot of change work and you find that it's draining, then probably you don't have your resources at hand and readily available. Make sure that you're doing all the self care that you need so that you've got, um, the emotional and state agility <laughs> to move in and then move cleanly out. Okay. Uh, and again, you can also, uh, Grinder does a lot of stuff on filters, uh, all kinds of stuff on filters, but I, I think that they're, you know, they're not entirely in, uh, always necessary. Another question this year. Um, she says, and uh, she's looking forward to the neuron code in November. Yes. Uh, so we've got one more question. Uh, that's from Shayan Tony. Would you like to pronounce that first? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, so the question is, mm. so while modeling, if the practitioner has shaky sense of their personal boundaries, mm -hmm. is it possible to lose themselves in the stories or habits of the person they are modeling? Okay. Again, a habit is something that is very um, ingrained. It has neurological structures to it. And so, I don't know, let's, let's say that I had, uh, the habit of, um, doing backflips. Okay. So just every once in a while, I would just do a backflip for fun. Now, if I model, if somebody's modeling me, they're probably not going to pick up backflips because they don't have a structure for backflips. Now I don't have a structure for backflips. Let's face it. If I backflip, I just flop and there'd be ambulances being called, I'm guessing. <laughs> but, but the point is, is that basically there's an entire structure, a neurological structure to support that habit. So unless it is something that you've had a history with yourself and that you're still struggling with, then that's when it's going to become an issue. But you know, my, 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 you know, recommendation to people when I mentor them in terms of doing change work, uh, and, and being a facilitator, I usually tell people, if you have a problem with doing something and it's not something that you've been able to get to, to work out very well for yourself, and it puts you in a very unresourceful state, if somebody comes to you with exactly the same issue, you might want to consider referring them on to someone else. If you're recovering from drugs, and somebody's recovering from drugs and, and, and they want your help, then maybe you're going to wait and see those kinds of clients only when you feel really great about that. The other thing I'm also going to say is, is that if you find that you have issues with establishing clear boundaries between yourself and your clients, take some time and develop some clear boundaries, <laughs> model somebody who's got some clear boundaries. How do they do that? What's it like? when they're operating around other people and they've got clear boundaries. Soak that in for a bit, you know, that that's a skill worth receiving. Um, and so, yeah, go, go find somebody who does that really well and then say, look, I'd like to sit in on some of your sessions and just, and just please, you know, can I do that as a learner? And, um, you know, can I, can, can I watch you be an exemplar of this? And, uh, if they've got some clients who are willing um, to do that and have an observer in the room, then, then do that. You use the modeling tool. Anything else, Nishi? I guess that's about it. Uh, we'll just wait for a second. There's lots of people are typing, so, uh, Okay, so this is from Ashok. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm asking what are the risks of modeling? Okay. What are the risks of modeling? Okay, uh, maybe I'm missing. I'm only hearing of modeling. So, uh, so this is from Ashok. Yes. And he wants to know what are the risks of modeling? What are the risks of modeling? Um, one thing that used to happen to me quite a lot, uh, was when I would build models, the glue would get stuck between my fingers and then I'd have to get like an exacto knife and separate my fingers. And, and <laughs> so the risks of modeling are very few unless, I don't know if you're modeling skydivers and you have to go jumping out of an airplane, there are inherent risks involved in that. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I, I have never heard of any credible risks of modeling other than um, the issues involved in doing whatever the thing is to be modeled. I guess, you know, race car drivers have certain risks. Astronauts have certain risks if you're riding along in their space capsule. Um, so, you know, uh, the only thing that is likely to be an issue, as I've said before, if you have drug addiction issues that you're working to get past, 
probably you don't want to work with drug drug addict, addicted clients until you've got a firm handle on that yourself, that kind of thing. But mostly, you know, uh, keep in mind this, anything that you do repeatedly, your brain develops infrastructure for. And so if somebody has done something every day of their lives, it's kind of like what I was talking about at the beginning with juggling. If you model a juggler and you don't have the first clue about how to juggle at the end of the modeling session, you may come up with some distinctions about how a good juggler gets better, but it will not help you to juggle <laughs> unless you spend an awful lot of time around that juggler. You're not going to be able to juggle because you don't have the muscle memory. You don't have the pattern, uh, the, the movement pattern memory. You don't have the neurological infrastructure to support you being a juggler. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I say that picking up some stuff. Now, I'll also say that if you are, if you are a juggler and you model an exemplar of excellence in juggling, you're going to pick up finer distinctions. You're going to pick up better distinctions and your analysis is going to be better because you already have the structures for juggling. Okay. So in the same way, um, if I had a problem with, I don't know, compulsive eating, that would not be the time for me to go and model uh, an exemplar of excellence in compulsive eating because maybe I'm going to learn to be a better compulsive eater. But don't do that. You know, if you've got, if you think that you have an issue around what this person is doing, then don't try to model an exemplar of terrible excellence when you know that that's a problem that you have. It really is that simple. Um, so, but on the other hand, you know, look, I mean, I do a lot of therapeutic work. I see anywhere between, uh, you know, three to sometimes 10 clients a week, depending on, on the week. And uh, I've never picked anything up from a client by modeling what they did that I know of. Maybe there's some secret stuff that I don't know about that I do in my sleep, but aside from possible, uh, somnambulism, <laughs> that I do in my sleep. I, I, I don't know of anything that, that, uh, that can pick up unless again, you have a specific problem and you're modeling somebody who also has, is better at doing the specific problem issue. Hope that's clear. Yes, I guess that's about it. Good, brilliant. So thank you uh, so much for uh, for being part of the uh, webinar and taking this session for us. Uh, uh, if you guys have uh, more questions, because I know that lots of you are still typing, but uh, we are way beyond time. If you still have questions, please feel free to write to us and we'll figure out a way to answer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for uh, taking this session for us. I'm really excited that you're Really excited for you to be at the conference. I hope to see you guys at the conference. Uh, it's going to be amazing, uh, inspiration, learning. So look forward to catching up with all of you. Absolutely, and uh, and thank you for thank you for hosting me, Nishith, and uh, thank you for uh, having me at the conference. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody in November. Uh, if you come to to see me uh, for the Neuron Code, you know uh, I'll I'll be happy to see you there. And if not, I'll see you at the conference. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you guys for joining in. Uh, we've had people from all over the world, so thank you for taking the time out. Uh, hopefully, we'll connect with you guys soon. All right, guys. Take care. Good night.